We welcome you to the program today. The title of the lesson, Blessed Are the Dead. It's based on Revelation 14, verses 12 to 13. It has been said that death is one appointment that we all must keep. In Hebrews 9, 27 to 28, And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. In the first century, there were Christians who faced death as martyrs persecuted, and even put to death for the faith. In the book of Revelation, the Apostle John wrote to encourage Christians. In Revelation 2.10, be faithful unto death. In writing to each of the seven churches in Asia, seven times he recorded promises for he who overcomes. While there would be believers who would suffer tribulation, led into captivity, and even killed, those who ever came were promised life beyond the grave. The book contains a message of hope, hope of the reward of heaven that awaits the faithful. Death occurs with the separation of the spirit from the body, according to James. Not only is there the promise of eternal life for the faithful, but vindication for the righteous and condemnation of the wicked in judgment. Before we look at Revelation 14, verses 12 to 13, consider the following points from the preceding passages. We learn in Revelation 14, 7, that only God is worthy of our worship. Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth. In verses 9 to 11, we see a warning against apostates, those who turn from the truth from the religion of Christ and instead practice false worship and service. Particularly in Revelation 14, 9 to 11, we see that he refers to this as those who worship the beast and his image. He says in verse 10 that they will drink of the wrath of God that they will be tormented with fire and brimstone, and that their torment will be forever and ever. And in verse 11, we learn that they will have no rest, day or night. Of course, all who refuse to heed the Lord will ultimately be lost. Our scripture today is found in verses 12 and 13. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. First, we see from our passage, Revelation 14, 12, a call to patience. Here is the patience of the saints. The term saints, according to Vine's expository dictionary, refers to those who are sanctified or holy. And to, so to these holy people. The holy, as people of God, were called to continue in holiness with patience. Revelation 1 9, 2 2 to 3, verse 19, 
and chapter 3 and verse 10. The footnote to the New King James Version reads, steadfastness, perseverance. And so alternative translations for patience, steadfastness, perseverance may also be translated as endurance, as we see in Hebrews 10 and verse 36. They would need to be steadfast in the faith. They would need to endure persecutions and tribulations and hardships. And they would need to persevere to go through the severe. Earlier, there was the warning that some believers would be taken into captivity and killed. And so the need for patience. The word martyr referred to a witness. And it came to be a witness who would die for the faith. In Revelation 13, 9 to 10, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. We learn that those who continued steadfastly in patience would be ultimately victorious in Christ. No matter what they did to the flesh, that the spirit would live on and be with Christ. There are various instances of patience in the book of Revelation. The same term translated patience is found seven times in the book. The apostle John, the writer of the book, described himself as a companion with his brethren in tribulation and patience. And Revelation 1 and 9 I, John, both your brother and companion in tribulation, the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. John, as well as his brethren, would suffer through tribulation. And so would need patience for keeping the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. There would be those who would turn from the faith because of persecution, tribulation. But John encouraged his readers in the first century to practice patience, that is to endure, to persevere, to be steadfast, come what may, regardless of what they faced. And ultimately, they would be rewarded with eternal life with the Lord. The Lord spoke to the churches of Asia about patience. There were churches of Christ in Asia Minor. And these churches received word from the Lord, things that they needed to change or they needed to continue in as well. The church at Ephesus in Revelation 2, 2 to 3, for example, was mentioned for their patience. The Lord said, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. And so twice in this passage, he uses that same term for patience. I know your patience, the Lord said. I know you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. And so in this, they, they served as a good example. The church in Thyatira was also mentioned for patience. In Revelation 2 and 19, I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. 
And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Another church that was mentioned for patience, the church in Philadelphia. Revelation 3 and 10, because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole earth to test those who dwell upon the earth. Jesus, in warning his disciples of persecution, promised in Luke 21, 19, by your patience, possess your souls. His disciples would face tribulation, persecution, temptation. But he exhorted them, saying, by your patience, possess your souls. And James, a disciple of Jesus, taught in James 1, 2 to 4, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. How can one count it all joy when falling into various trials? Remember who these trials are for. He said that the testing of your faith produces patience. And so as they endure, their faith was tested, they would grow in patience. And patience that one may be complete or perfect and lacking nothing. The Apostle Paul also wrote in Romans 5, 3 to 4, how that one can grow in perseverance or patience. He said, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance, character, and character, hope. Again, how can one have joy in trials? How can one glory in tribulations? Rather than having shame in tribulations, they would have glory knowing that they were suffering, not for any wrongdoing they had done. They were suffering for righteousness sake, for the sake of the Lord himself. And so there was glory. No one wanted to suffer, but if they need, must suffer, that it would be for the sake of Christ, for the sake of righteousness. And they were promised the reward of heaven. And so tribulation produces perseverance, patience, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. And today we're talking about this message of hope. Revelation 14, 12, he said, here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. He began by saying, here is the patience of the saints. And now he says, here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The clause again refers to the patience of the saints. First, keep the commandments of God. Note the word keep in its connection with patience. First, keep, continue to obey, not neglecting, not violating God's commandments. Second, keep the faith of Jesus. And so continue in patience. True, the saints were to keep their faith in Jesus, but particularly, as said in the text, literally, the faith of Jesus. That is, continue in the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus and the religion of Jesus. The system of faith. Earlier, John wrote of those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ in Revelation 12 and 17. In Revelation 6, 
And verse 9, he says, the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Again, the idea of keep the commandments and the faith of Jesus. Here it says the testimony, the word of God and the testimony which they held. He describes how these brethren were martyrs, witnesses for the faith, willing to even die for the faith. The souls of those who have been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. We're familiar with different martyrs in the Bible. For example, the Stephen, the disciple of Jesus, and also in the book of Revelation, a disciple by the name of Antipas. As they would keep these things in obedience to the word of God and to the testimony of his son, the faith of Jesus, they would prove their patience. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and have and the faith of Jesus. And so in this book of symbols, the book of Revelation, we see various symbols encouraging the brethren of the, of the first century to continue in the faith, regardless of the trials, the temptations, the persecutions, the sufferings that they endured. And today, disciples of Christ, too, can learn from this book to be faithful, to continue to keep the commandments and the testimony, the faith of Jesus Christ. Second, we see a life of faithfulness. In Revelation 14, verse 13, the first part of that passage, he said, Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, John heard a heavenly voice. The particular identity of the speaker in the passage is not given. Perhaps the voice from heaven is God. Sometimes heaven represents God himself. And so perhaps the voice from heaven is God, or perhaps a, a messenger of God. Now, later in the passage, we see that it is the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who speaks to John. He says in verse 13, the heavenly voice, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. The message from heaven is in the form of a beatitude, blessed. For example, many are familiar with the beatitudes of Jesus found in Matthew chapter 5. The heavenly voice told John, write. Note that these words did not originate with John. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. These words do not originate with John, who wrote by revelation of the Lord. These inspired words, the words themselves came from heaven. In the New Testament, the term blessed may also be rendered or translated as happy, such as in Acts 26.2 and Romans 14.22. Happy are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. And so blessed describes a state or condition of, of happiness, yes, but so much more. Of course, Paul wrote that the peace of God surpasses all understanding. There are many things about heaven that we simply do not understand or can comprehend. But, but Paul makes the point that to die and to be with the Lord is far better. He says, blessed are the dead. And so the voice from heaven tells John, right, blessed are the dead. We have to note that not everyone will be happy. 
Certainly the apostates who die, who refuse to obey God, will not be happy as they will be in torment, according to Revelation 14, 9 to 11. Now, according to Peter, if God had his way, no one would perish in their sins. But everyone would repent of their sins and, and be saved. Of course, Paul taught in writing to Timothy that God desires for all to be saved and to come to knowledge of the truth. And as Peter wrote in his epistle, God does not wish for any to perish, but they all come to repentance. But nevertheless, those who refuse to obey God and Christ, the only Savior, will not be happy. The heavenly voice said to write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. I know the title of the lesson is Blessed Are the Dead. And perhaps that may be misleading. But it goes on. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. We certainly don't want to mislead you. The passage continues as we're studying that the blessing resides not just in being dead. We all one day will we'll see death. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. This state of blessing is found in Christ. All spiritual blessings reside in him. This refers to the saints who, with patience, keep the commandments of God in the faith of Jesus. Note that there is consciousness in life after and note, note that they are said to be blessed or blessed. They are happy. He says, who die in the Lord. What does it mean to be in the Lord? To be in the Lord is to be spiritually united with Christ. This union is accomplished when the believer believes and obeys the gospel. That is, by being baptized into Christ. Is this what the scriptures teach? It certainly is, according to Romans 6, verse 3. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? How does one get into Christ? According to Paul, the apostle, in Romans 6 and 3, we are baptized into Christ. Look at Galatians 3, 26 to 27. He said, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Remember what Jesus said in Mark 16, 15 to 16? Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe shall be condemned. Here Paul says you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. He says as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. How does one get into the Lord? We are baptized into Christ. We were spiritually united together with him at the point of our obedience to the gospel. No, it's not about somehow earning our salvation by our own works. We note the grace and the mercy, the love of God in relation to our salvation. If not for the grace and mercy of God, no one could be saved. All would be lost. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But there are things that we must do. As with a gift, one must receive the gift. And so as we receive him, you know, believing and obeying, the gospel. 
course, in Romans, Paul says in chapter 10, all who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But then later on in the same passage, he says, but not all have obeyed the gospel. And so we need we note the importance of faith and obedience to the gospel of Christ. The gospel is good news. The good news of Christ, that Christ died for our sins. That we have the forgiveness of our sins through his sacrifice and the hope of everlasting life in him. It is by the Spirit that we are baptized in the one body, according to 1 Corinthians 12 and 13. And in 1 Corinthians 12 and 27, we read of the, of the body of Christ, or the church of Christ. Ephesians chapter 5, 23, Colossians 1, 24. Uh, the body, which is the church. Of course, Jesus said, I will build my church. Sometimes the word church is used in the sense of a congregation. For example, the churches of Asia refers to those churches of Christ who uh, assembled in Asia Minor. Uh, Romans 16, 16, the churches of Christ greet you. It's also used in the sense of the church universal when Jesus promised, I will build my church. But here we see that we're spiritually united together with Christ at the point of our obedience to the gospel of Christ. If not then, when? Of course, we read about the conversion of Saul of Tarsus in Acts chapter 9 and 16. At what point were his sins washed away? Acts twenty two sixteen. 16. And why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. We read in Acts chapter 2, 38, repent and be baptized. Later on in the same chapter, we see that those who were baptized were added to them. The Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved, Acts 2 and 47. The lesson here in Revelation is to be faithful. Before one may die in the Lord, he must first live faithful in the Lord. And so one may believe and be baptized in obedience to the gospel, but will he continue in the faith? It is therefore necessary for saints to have patience or steadfastness, perseverance, endurance. We see here encouragement for believers. The voice from heaven continued saying, from now on. Note that blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Well, what did he mean? Well, there are different ideas. But note this. With the death of Jesus and his resurrection, from this point on, believers have the hope in Jesus that we will be raised. And so Jesus died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. From now on, perhaps he had in mind the sacrifice of Jesus. And Jesus gave his life, shed his blood for our sins. And from that point on, we have forgiveness through him. This promise is not limited to contemporaries of John, such as the martyrs of the faith, Yes, the, the church in the first century would go through great persecution. But the church at various times in existence has faced persecution. And so the need to be faithful. 
And so the promise is not limited to those who lived during the time of John the Apostle, such as the martyrs of the faith, but also extends to the faithful saints of every generation. Consider the Beatitudes of Jesus, particularly the final Beatitude in Matthew 5. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 10, Jesus said, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then in verses 11 and 12, he said, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you, and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. If you find yourself facing persecution for the faith, for the sake of righteousness, you find yourself in good company. The prophets themselves were persecuted in the past. Jesus said, blessed are you. Happy are those who are persecuted. Not many wish to be persecuted, to suffer suffer uh, tribulation or temptation, these other things. But people of faith willing to endure for the sake of Christ and with it, the glory, the glory of heaven. Will it be worth it? It will be worth it. After all, eternal life with the Lord above. Number three, a hope of rest. Revelation 14, verses, verse 13, the second half of the verse. He said, yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. The testimony here is from the Holy Spirit. Earlier, we see the, the voice from heaven. The Spirit here says, yes. It is true. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes. Those who die in the Lord are promised rest. Of course, with labor... There's the need for rest. We see a promised rest ahead. In this life, we labor as saints. Hebrew 4 and verse 11. In this chapter, he talks about the promised rest for the faithful. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Some say that there's nothing that you need to do to be saved. But is that true? You rem do you remember the jailer in Acts chapter 16? Who asked, what must I do to be saved? Was he told, there's nothing that you need to do to be saved? No. That might have been a good time to rebuke the man for a false notion, if it was indeed false. But there is something that we need to do. It has always been necessary to trust and obey. In Hebrews 4.11, let us be diligent to enter that rest. How so? Be faithful. Obey the commandments of God and be faithful to the faith of Christ. Be patient, persevere, endure. Be steadfast for the faith. While persecuted, our reward is great in heaven. However, this rest eludes the apostates that we mentioned earlier. According to Revelation 14, 11, particularly those who worship the beast, he said, they will have no rest day or night. And so while the saints who remain faithful are promised rest, those people mentioned earlier in the chapter, they will receive no such rest. The Spirit says that 
their works follow them. Speaking of the saints, the good works or deeds that we do in this life are important. They do matter. They are acknowledged and rewarded by God. Sometimes people become distressed. Sometimes frustrated as, as though no one cares. But God sees and certainly he cares. As believers, we are told that we will rest from our labors in this life. But our works that we do here, our good deeds, will go with us. They will follow us into life beyond the grave. There are many things in this life that we cannot take with us. Jesus told about the rich fool who thought he had everything, had so much that he tore down his barn to build bigger. But he didn't know that that night his soul, soul would be required of him. He would die. And he did. And he did not take it with him. But we see that one thing that we'll follow is our works. And so we will rest from our labors here in this world and our works will go with us beyond the grave. We see the importance of good works. While we are not justified by works only, neither are we justified by faith only. In James 2 and 24, you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. We're taught in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, in the resurrection chapter of the Bible. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. It matters. No, we do not earn our salvation through our good works. It is not as though we could somehow do enough good to somehow merit our redemption. Jesus paid that costly price with the ransom of his own blood on the cross. He died for our sins. And we who believe the gospel, the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ, and obey the gospel are promised remission of sins, Acts 2.38. Mark 16, 16. In this life, we can live for good works because of his sacrifice. We who have believed and obeyed the gospel, forgiven of our past sins, as we continue in the light, we're promised that his sacrifice, his blood, will continue to cleanse us from our sins. We see in the book, the epistle of John. And so, your work, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Good works follow the dead to judgment. Good or bad. 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And so, based on these things that we have done, we will answer for these things in the judgment. This lesson is also taught in this passage, as well as the book of uh, the book of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, that we will answer for with what we have done. And so, the need to to we would be wise to begin early to follow Him, to fear God, and keep His commandments. Paul encourages his brethren not to become discouraged. Galatians chapter 6 and 9, he said, And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Here he's writing to Christians, to fellow saints. People who's, who sometimes fall short and, and need continued forgiveness of the Lord. In Galatians 6, 9, he said, do not grow weary 
or exhausted while doing good, remember that we will reap. We sow what we reap what we sow, Paul said. We will reap if we do not lose heart or become discouraged. Second Thessalonians 3.13, but as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. And so similar lesson in both epistles, one to the church at Galatia, another to the church at Thessalonica. And of course, the churches of Christ today. As Christians, as we have believed and obeyed the gospel, been baptized into Christ, that we arise to walk in newness of life, that we, we live for holiness and righteousness and doing good works in the glory of God. Remember what Jesus taught in Matthew, uh, the Sermon on the Mount? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. It's not about us. Because of his sacrifice, and as we have submitted to the gospel, we are forgiven through him and his sacrifice. And we can live more and more each day that we've been blessed to be here to become more godly. Be holy, for I am holy, the Lord said. We see the blessed hope. Live for the Lord. In Titus chapter 2, 11 to 14, Paul wrote to Titus, he said, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. We are called to live a life of patience, keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus and live in faithfulness until we die. We who die in the Lord are promised rest. The beatitude is not just blessed are the dead, but instead the beatitude reads, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. In the book of Revelation, we see a message of hope for the faithful. In Revelation 2.10, be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life, the Lord said. Repeatedly, in writing to the seven churches of Asia, he used the word overcomes. He who overcomes. If we can overcome the tribulation, the persecution, the temptation. If we can be faithful and keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, the testimony of the Lord, we were promised this blessing, this hope of heaven. Blessed are the dead. Happy are the dead in Christ. Are you in Christ? Have you believed and obeyed the gospel of Christ? If you have, resolve to live faithful to Christ. If you're not a Christian, consider becoming one. Hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. If you are a Christian, but you have been unfaithful, you've turned back to the world and to a life of, of sin, we would encourage you, as Peter did, the man who was who became a Christian in Acts chapter 8, who later sinned and showed that his heart wasn't right. He was told by Peter, repent, change your heart, and pray that perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. And so repent and go to the Lord in prayer. Think about these things. We encourage you to seek the Lord and all that you do. Thank you for being here today.